Morning, everybody. Welcome to our first Ask the, Ask, Ask the Expert series. This is our pilot episode. What the intention of the Ask the Expert series is to give the techs career opportunity, career advancement knowledge, tech training, problem solving, and how to run your operations. Each segment is going to be 15 to 20 minutes, and we'll, Scott is going to do a presentation. And then after that, you will be open to ask any questions that you want. Just please open up your chat line and let me know and we'll ask them. Um, if you have any questions, this is our first episode. So we will be asking you to send us some feedback afterwards. Let me introduce Scott Manley from Lombard Zoco and he will be doing how to use a TDS meter. Scott, it's all you. Thanks, Hyland. One sec, I gotta fix something on my screen. Ah, that'll work. Cool. Well, hey, thanks everyone for attending. Thanks for all 84 of you now. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honor to uh, be here in front of you uh, talking about TDS meters and water quality. Um, I'd really like to thank Highland and Monty for really helping me out with this and the SCA. Um, my name is Scott Manley. I work in uh, tech support at La Marzocco as a water quality specialist. And I'm using a slide deck that you can't see because that's as far as I got. So this is going to be a quick presentation in 15 to 20 minutes. It's going to be covered in three parts. Uh, the first part is what is TDS? A quick overview of, you know, what are we looking for? Second is what's TDS meter and how do you use it? And the third is, well, how do we use the results? What does it mean to us as a technician? So total dissolved solids is, the, is, the, is defined as or can be defined as the sum of the concentration of ionized substances in water. As technicians, we are concerned with those substances in municipally treated water that affect equipment performance and copy extraction. So there's really only a handful of substances that we're, we're actually concerned with, and those are covered in the SEA's Water Quality Handbook, as well as La Marzocco's Water Spec. Many of you have seen it. I answer the phones about these questions quite frequently, and this is gonna explain uh, a subset of how to test for some of those things, specifically the solids. Um, so going over that, uh, there are, well, there's only like five or six parameters in copy that we're dealing with. Only four of those that we're regularly testing for that we're really concerned with, they're actually solids that can be tested with a TDS meter. Uh, that's gonna be your total hardness, your alkalinity, your iron, and your chloride. Now. Iron doesn't play a big factor in this. If you have an iron problem in your water, you probably already know it because it only takes one to two parts per million before you start seeing you know, rust stains everywhere. So what is TDS? Well, it's, it's the sum of those things. So your hardness plus your alkalinity plus your iron plus your chloride and possibly some other things is gonna equal approximately plus or minus 10 percent your total dissolved solids this is uh this is an important measurement and a way in which you use tds meter to better assess water quality in our cafes everyone following along so far everyone awake uh, i just had my coffee so if i look a little bit tired it's because i am tired so so what is a TDS meter? Why are we here? So a TDS meter basically is just an electroconductivity meter. It measures conductivity of dissolved solids in water. There are other ways to measure dissolved solids in water like uh, gravimetric analysis, whereby you take, let's say a liter of water and you boil everything off and then you weigh it on like an analytical balance or a scale. Um, probably a bit more accurate, but also energy intensive and very time consuming. I, I couldn't imagine sitting in a cafe uh, with a boiling a liter of water sitting around, you know, checking my Facebook. Uh, it probably wouldn't look too good to the customer. So we use something a little simpler, maybe not quite as accurate, but um, gets the job done. And it's a little meter like this. Probably most of you guys probably have them. Um, and uh, it measures electroconductivity water and micro siemens and then it converts that to a number that we can use or a factorization as we say and that uh, factorization is is representative of a result it's approximately the number you would get 
in parts per million or milligrams per liter if you were to boil off that same liter of water and then measure the result. The factor for fresh water, primarily what we're using, and according to the SEA handbook, is 442 water, which is approximately 0 0.7, 0 0.71. And that's going to give you broadly, you know, plus or minus 10%, a fairly accurate reading of what those dissolved solids are. Um, so a TDS meter comes in three broad categories um, as I define them. Uh, the first is a fixed, fixed TDS meter, meaning that uh, you turn the thing on, you hit a button, it just gives you a number back. Generally, that number is either going to be, it's either a straight EC number in microsiemens, that they, you didn't got to figure out the factorization or it's probably a salinity meter. That's the most common type of meter you're gonna find on Amazon for like 10 bucks. The second is gonna be one with selectable TDS. Probably gonna have several buttons on it, allow you to change between your electroconductivity, salinity, TDS. Gives you a way to look at a couple different things. Although TDS is really the only one we're interested in. And the third type, which is what I'm holding here, is an adjustable TDS meter, meaning that you can actually change the factorization on it. It's not preset. You can actually take the cap off of this thing. And there's tiny little buttons in here in which you can move that number from 0.55 to 0.8 or actually to 1 either in either direction. And that will, uh, that you know, if you were doing um, routine water quality analysis in a particular area with, you know, water all from the same source. You could probably adjust that factorization to better match your, your results so that when you're out in the field testing, uh, you have a better idea of what's going on. So this is the kind of hands-on part of my demonstration, which is how do we use a TDS meter and what do we expect in terms of results? Um, this is a Oakton TDS low meter. It's uh, it's old, I've had it for many years. Uh, it's not the most fancy thing, but it gets the job done. So going from my right to my left, we've got five different waters here. Uh, the first being distilled water, which gives us a TDS of, and this is, I apologize, hard to read, but zero. And that's because there are no dissolved solids in it and water without any dissolved ions is a pure insulator, it doesn't conduct electricity. Second, we have RO, or reverse osmosis water. This is from my own house. Um, and I'm getting, oops, I'm getting a TDS of about 20. And so most RO systems, home RO systems, the commercial RO systems that we use in cafes um, generally would give you a reduction rate of between 95 and 98%. So if you're using a TDS meter, you can quickly assess whether or not that RO system is functioning properly by comparing the source water going into the system to the permeate water going out of the membrane. My third sample is Aquapana. And this is actually bottled water. Uh, from Scarperia in Italy, actually the same uh, town where our factory uh, is located. And the water is 170 parts per million on this meter. Uh, it's, uh, it's a water that uh, our company recommends as bottled water for the home. I will say that it's actually a little bit on the hard side, so it's gonna be a little bit of a scaling issue, but apart from that, it's just fine. And uh, fourth, I've got tap water from my house, just to give you an idea of what that reduction looks like. And I'm getting 220 parts per million. And that's the difference between uh, uh, my RO and my tap water is that my reverse osmosis system is removing approximately 90-ish percent of the total dissolved solids uh, that's coming into that system. It's a quick, easy way to verify whether the RO system is working, like I said. And fifth, we've got um, my beer because it's five o'clock somewhere. <clears throat> so how do we interpret these results? Well, I gave you some indication about how you can use a TDS meter, verifying a permeate stream off of an RO system to make sure the RO system's functioning properly. You can also use it, like I said, as a sum of the concentration of analytes. So if you were to take and measure individually, either with test strips or drop count titration or a spectrophotometer, your total hardness, your alkalinity, your iron, and your chloride, 
and you were to sum all those up, just add all the parts per million, it's going to be somewhere approximately what you're going to see on your TDS meter if it's everything's working properly. So there are two camps, pro broadly speaking, that I run into or I encounter in the coffee industry, not so much with technicians, but more with roasters and cafes. So this is information really specifically for technicians. And those two camps are TDS is everything. Somebody in their cafe uses the TDS meter and that number is the holy grail of what their water is supposed to be. They've read that number in the SCA water quality handbook and that's the only number that they've put any sort of uh, meaning to. The second camp is TDS is meaningless. These are the people who have gone down the rabbit hole of water. They've tested everything. They know how to manually titrate. They may have a spectrophotometer. They're in really good with their local water lab. Um, and they're really concerned about whether they got 68 parts per million magnesium or 71 parts per million magnesium. And, and apparently they can taste the difference. Now, I would tell you that both of these are kind of, and so what they'll say is the TDS doesn't matter. It's really all the whatever underneath. And I'll tell you that both of those, by and large, are inaccurate. If the tool is used properly, um, one, it can tell you a lot about the other tests that you're using to determine water quality and whether or not you're being effective and accurate in that. So it's kind of a checksum on what you're doing. Um, and so TDS isn't meaningless. It has a specific value uh, in regards to the work that we perform as technicians. Um, as far as TDS being everything, well, that's just people that aren't willing to look beyond um, really simplistic numbers. But it does give us an opportunity to have a conversation with those people about what the rest of the substances in their water are. So, a um, couple of things to know. So when you're testing water and using a TDS meter, and let's say you've tested out those four or five other things, and we're excluding chlorine, total chlorine, chloramines, things like that. Those are all dissolved gases. They don't show up in a TDS meter anyways. Um, and they're actually substances that you're going to remove with uh, basic filtration with carbon blocks, or you should be. Um, so a couple things to note. So if your, your TDS value, like the number you get with your meter when you test the water, is far less than the sum of those individual analytes your hardness, your alkalinity, your iron chloride, could be that you had a problem with one of the tests you just performed. Potentially uh, accidentally double dropped some titrant into a sample and it gave you a false reading. So this is a good way to know whether your other tests are working or not. Secondly, if your TDS is far more than the sum of those analytes, well, you probably have an unaccounted for analyte, which could be something like sodium, uh, free sodium in water is kind of hard to test for, uh, or sulfates, which is another common one. So, and you can have other dissolved solids that aren't electroconductive, like silicates, uh, silica, sand, basically. Um, other certain organic chemicals are not going to be um, electroconductive as well, like sugar, for instance, although generally we don't find that in high concentrations in potable water. And the same is pretty much true of sulfates, generally speaking. So hopefully you guys got something out of this well, rather quick hit. I can see that I'm actually at 14 minutes. I haven't hit quite 15. I could probably drag this out um, or drink some more beer. Um, but in conclusion, TDS meter is an efficient and convenient tool for technicians to quickly assess water quality while in the field, um, relatively inexpensive to acquire, and doesn't require you to use any kind of reagent other than occasionally having to check the calibration. So. That is basically my quick presentation on the TDS meter. I know there's probably a lot more to it than that. I mean, I know there's a lot more to it than that, but this is what we can cover in five minutes, uh, 15 minutes, and we can cover some of the rest of that in our Q&A or you know, reach out to me individually at a later date, so. Scott, thanks. I've got quite a few questions. Uh, oh boy. First, the first, we are here, we're gonna keep you busy, man. Uh, okay. The first question is, um, what is the difference between grain, GPG, PPM, and TDS? Wait, wait, repeat that, sorry. What is the difference between grains per gallon, parts per million, and TDS? Okay, so TDS is just the factorization of total dissolved solids. It can be rep usually represented in parts per million uh, 
And parts per million can be converted into grains per gallon is 17.1 parts per million per grain. It's roughly, I think, analogous to German degrees. There's a bunch of different ways and uh, indices that are used to measure water quality analytes. Um, and you'll find most of the water industry uses parts per million because it's just easy. We convert everything to a common mass of CaCO3. Um, but if you're using uh, drop count titration kits, like say from your aquarium supply, it may have those uh, numbers or indices in uh, different uh, uh, forms. So. Okay. Thank you. Next question is, can you explain what would happen if we change the factor on the meter with these samples? So, uh, well, I'm not going to mess with this one right now because it's actually a pain. Um, but uh, so if we change the factorization, what we're going to see is either our TDS is going to go up or down. A prime example of this and one that uh, I run into a lot with people who, when I presented something like, hey, you know, your total dissolved solids is way less than your analyte count, what I usually find is they're using a salinity meter. That's a TDS meter that uses a factorization of 0.5. And generally speaking, when using those with fresh water, you're going to see a difference of about 30-ish percent, or it's going to read a salinity meter is going to read about 30 percent less than the actual TDS of the fresh water. And it has to do with the difference in the specific conductance of the analytes being measured. Thank you. Um, next question is, if you aren't testing on site, how would you best suggest transporting and storing samples before testing? How about if customers are mailing samples to you? Yeah, it's a good question. That's something that, uh, you know, as a water quality specialist, we instituted or we built our own micro water lab in uh, Seattle. And that was one of the questions that came up was, well, how do we transport this water? Because there's a lot of, um, there's this idea that water, you know, it does change, it changes rapidly actually every minute, but you know, in a sealed container, it doesn't change that much. Um, the big one usually, and you'll see this if you're submitting samples to uh, and, uh, compliance laboratories uh, that supply you the bottle, they'll tell you something like, well, we need this sample back in a couple of days because the pH is gonna shift so much. In my experience, that's not true. Not generally. It it takes it probably takes months to be honest in a properly sealed container. So you know anything that's a clean, clear container should work. Um, do you suggest? Actually, this is the question I was going to ask too. Do you suggest testing water at cafe at different points of the year and reevaluate uh, water filtration through winter months? And actually, let's add the question we were talking about: is what happens if you're taking Water, a water sample off of your brewer and then off of your tap, and there's a huge difference. Well, first of all, I wouldn't recommend testing water off of your brewer. And the reason for that is the boiler, just like testing off of your espresso machine. It tends to concentrate things in there. And so it's gonna give you not an accurate reading of the water going into it. And it's not something you can, you can actually use to plan for your water filtration because that's gonna shift, it's gonna change. And what you want is the most, consistent measurement of the source water going into your cafe. Okay. So that's going to be your water before you filter. Next question is, I've heard of using a refractometer instead of a TDS meter. Can you use these interchangeably or are they telling me different things? Yeah, so I haven't used a refractometer to check TDS, um, but it's not actually a common um, tool in terms of water quality analysis. Now it may be, it's probably more common for testing coffee or syrups, juices and things like that, because you can use it to determine roughly the concentrations of solutions. Specifically, it's gonna be solutions that aren't electroconductive like sugars. I My limited experience with that is I one, at one point took this contract to install a bunch of juice machines for a Florida cooperative that I wish I had never taken, but it involved using a TDS me or a refractometer frequently to uh, adjust the concentration mix in these uh, juice machines. Okay. Um, can we use the TDS meter to check if our ion exchange cartridge works? Generally, no, and that's because in an ion exchange, your, your TDS is just being exchanged generally one for one. And while those two different substances probably have different electroconductivity values, uh, it's not gonna be great enough to be determinant if that system's actually working. 
And because you're actually looking at a specific ion uh, that you're trying to exchange for, you need to use something very specific. Whereas a TDS meter is a um, uh, very non-specific uh, or general way of seeing, uh, you know, what's in your water. Okay. Um, do we're getting a lot of questions, dude? <laughs> You're gonna be busy. Not oh, sorry, non-selective way. Non sorry, it's early in the morning. The TDS results change when you boil water. Yeah, they they well. Yeah, if you boil water, you're gonna reduce or, or uh, uh, concentrate the volume of uh, uh, analytes in water, depending on how much how much water you boil off. So okay. yeah. Um. Please explain more about 442. Ah, 442 is a uh, calibration solution that was created by a company called Myron L, and they make uh, PDS meters, water quality testing equipment. And 442, which I can't remember the exact uh, components, uh, is a calibration solution that you use with your TDS meter to determine whether the, to set the TDS meter up so that it, it will read properly to a relative degree. Um, and it's designed to approximate the concentration of ions in most fresh waters okay. as a calibration solution, as opposed to most other, you know, like I said earlier, salinity meters, which if you have a meter that says calibrate to NACL, then that's a salinity meter and mm -hmm. the factorization is set and you're just calibrating it with that salt solution. So how often should you recalibrate your meter? You know, most meter manufacturers say like at least once a month. Um, and I found that to be, actually I found this meter to be relatively stable. Um, it may depend on the meter. Uh, I have a few others at work. Uh, like many of you, I'm, I'm stuck at home during this COVID thing. So I don't have access to some of the other tools I normally have. Um, but this is the one I've kept in my toolbox for all these years. Okay. Um, is it correct to measure only the alkalinity for filter calibration? Uh, well, no, I mean, I suppose if uh, if alkalinity was your primary concerning and you're using an anion exchange media, then, you know, or anion exchange me uh, membrane or something, uh, I suppose. But generally, that no single point test is gonna tell you enough about your water quality to make a determination if the filter's working properly or not. So I have a question and I have a, and there's another question here. How do you communicate these results to the customer and how do you convince them that, excuse me, how important this is? One of the things we see is an, an error in translation working with customers. So how do you convince a, climate, a client that it's important to put a water filter in place using your TDS? Well, it's like I said, since you can tell you the, the non-selective way, the total dissolved solid, the total concentration of ions, uh, it's quick and visible. People can see it, unlike, say, a uh, dip strip, which is really temporal, or uh, drop count titration, which um, is also color metric. So, I mean, 12% like of the people can't see color, men. Um, but, uh, no, it's it's a quick and easy way to show somebody, uh, you know, a number that represents something. And most people, are, like I said, in, in cafes and roasters are generally more familiar with that number than the other ones. Um, but that's a difficult that's a difficult thing. I spend probably, you know, a good 20% of my week on the phone with people trying to convince them that they, you know, in one form or fashion need additional filtration or remediation for the water that they have. Um, what kits do you recommend for checking the different dissolved solids? I'm sorry? What what kits do you recommend for checking the different TDS? Different Oh, like the different analytes? So yeah. like checking your hardness. So uh, for field service technicians, I find that drop count titration is relatively inexpensive and fairly accurate. I'm fairly partial to Hawk brand kits, like for total dissolve, or sorry, total hardness, the Hawk 5B kits, like $20 gives you 100 tests, um, pretty simple to use. Um, I've used other manufacturers drop count kits and I've used some from like the the fish store but I find Hawk tends to be the most easiest to understand and it returns numbers and values that are meaningful to us as water you know as technicians as opposed to is my aquarium working okay or something like that right so it, the, the 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 TDS kit and the Hodge kit need to be part of your your your, your standard carry correct yeah you, oh, you, need to exactly. every, you, you should do it every service 
Ideally, yeah. I mean, that's uh, it's it doesn't really take that long to go through those several parameters. Um, I don't test for chlorine or, or chloramines or things like that, but I do test generally for hardness. Uh, I will test for alkalinity and I will test for chloride. Those are the three. I mean, like I said, iron, if you got an iron problem, you don't need to test for it. You know it. Um, it's going to start staining things. You'll see some blackishness around uh, drains and things like that. So if we use RO water for espresso extraction, can it still have a variable result? If what? Sorry. If we use RO for espresso extraction, can it still have a variable result? Can it still have a variable result? Mm -hmm. You mean, is the RO permeate water inconsistent? Or I'm not sure what the question is. That's you the, question. The, 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 okay. the, the question is, if we use RO water for espresso extraction, can it still have a variable result? A variable result. Mm -hmm. um, no, generally, if an RO system is set up and working properly and installed properly, one of the advantages to it as a filtration solution is that it's generally highly predictable and meaning it's fairly consistent. Uh, an RO system doesn't remove everything from water. It doesn't, dis it doesn't remove dissolved gases. Um, so you can have uh, variation in pH coming out of an RO system. It can go up and down. And that, of course, will have some effect on, on your extraction uh, from a subjective standpoint, at least. Okay. Within the La Marzocco water calculator, what is the best result we can expect to see? I feel like most results I've seen, <clears throat> even if the result is green, it still indicates that the water has scale forming properties. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does make sense. And and I'll be honest with you, I think that the the water quality calculator uh, could use a little bit of uh, work. Um, I think it's broadly an accurate uh, uh, indicator, but it does use, for instance, like LSI or Langlier Saturation Index, which is okay. in, is a way of you know uh, trying to predict how much uh, calcium or scale is going to form, and you can do that without the calculator. Honestly, you can, you know, if your water's too far out of spec, too far off the SCA spec and hardness and alkalinity, you're going to notice it. So, okay. Um, users, we're going to do five more questions. Attendees, okay. well, hold on. I'm just going to let you know. So, uh, if you look in the panel, my email's there. <clears throat> if you have, sorry, if you have questions you want answered, please email them to me and I will get them to Scott so he can answer them for you personally. We'll probably take five to ten questions. Um, I just we're going to wrap up in about five minutes. Um, next question is: Do you pay close attention to the temperature of the sample? I've heard the temperature, if too cold from the source, can affect results. It can if you have a meter that isn't temperature compensated. Fortunately, most sure. even inexpensive meters are, so that's not so much of a concern. Although, if you have water that's excessively hot, which I see people do occasionally, like I said, from the boiler or a hot water tap. Yeah, that can affect the meter, and it usually gives you kind of weird results. I'd recommend letting the water cool if that's your only source to test from. What do you suggest to use on in the field as a water quality measurement kit? Oh, yeah. So a TDS meter, and I'm kind of – I haven't landed on, like, what's a solid, like, whole kit. You can buy an entire boiler test kit from Hawk for, like, $600, but it's got a whole bunch of stuff in there you're probably never going to use, and it's – a little too much money to spend on. But I would say a quality TDS meter is, is important because it's a simple, easy thing to use and you only have to buy it really once. Um, pH meter, which we haven't talked about, but that is also a good way to assess water quality. Uh, they're a little bit more finicky than TDS meters. You do have to calibrate them quite often and you kind of have to understand what it is, what results you're going to get. You have to have some expectation around that. Uh, drop count titration in the field tends to be the easiest. There are some other tools, some portable photometers and uh, then you can get you know, could spend a lot of money on like uh, ion selective electrodes and some apps on your phone but that's hundreds of thousands hundreds and possibly thousands of dollars um, but just simple drop count titration like I said I like Hawk their hardness kit alkalinity kit and chloride kit are easy to use and easy to understand and they, you can buy them in these little portable blow mold cases that look like little toolboxes would you mind putting together a list so we can put it on Facebook and social net, social network just like what you absolutely recommend. yes I appreciate absolutely. that <clears throat> um, uh, somebody asked you what the meter was that you're using. Oh, yeah, this is an Oakton TDS Tester Low. Um, it's a real basic temperature compensated meter. And like I said, it has an adjustable factorization. You can actually just move the factorization up and down with a couple of buttons. Um, so uh, it's people will probably be surprised to see that it actually only reads down to uh, 
in 10 increments the part per million it doesn't read down to you know single digits but it's not really necessary for what we do but i think most meters you're going to buy today are going to have a, a larger display and they'll probably read down to you know one point in uh, index, uh, indexes so um a little bit more accurate for your customer or more precise i would say so if you're showing it to a customer they might have a little more confidence in it realistically for what we're doing it doesn't really make that much of a difference so um how do you find out what the water quality of your area is oh good question so i use these a lot which is consumer confidence reports or water quality reports uh every municipality or municipal water source in the u.s is required to publish them annually or maybe biannually i find really great results with just googling the place i'm looking for with the word cc ccr after it or water quality report and generally i find something not every time maybe i have to look around because maybe the town that i'm looking at doesn't manage their own water and their water quality report is for the county or something like that but i find those to be actually really helpful okay we're gonna do five more questions some of them are really good does a salinity meter consistently read approximately 30 percent lower and if so can you add 30 percent of the results to get a more accurate measurement yeah, actually you can. I do this a lot with a, a lot of home customers that have salinity meters. I You don't simply add 30% more, but what you would do is multiply the result by two to return it to EC because it's just half of EC and then multiply your EC by 0. 0.7. Thank you. There are two types of hardness, total hardness and carbonate hardness. Do we use both? Basically total hardness is carbonate hardness though. I mean, you could be talking about calcium ion in concentration, uh, but generally we convert that number to CaCO3 because we need some kind of a relative mass to make comparisons between the different substances that we're looking at in water. So we're usually using total hardness. Oh, this is a good question. Is there any good real-time inline chlorine monitors? Yeah, and they're expensive. I know. I, I would say they're like a like thousand dollars each. Yeah, probably at least that. Yeah, no, there's some really fancy shit out that stuff out there, but uh, it's all really pricey, man. It's it's really expensive. Can you add that to the recommendation list just so we can have just so we can give them a reference? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I can put some other stuff on there. Like I've got a I use a Hannah Iris spectrophotometer. It's like twenty five hundred dollars at work. So. Um, how much ppm for an espresso? Nah. How many parts per million of total dissolved solids for espresso? Yeah. Oh man, that's a tough question because that's, uh, I mean, then what is that TDS that you're actually using for extraction? Um, right. It's it's one that, you know, I, I, I have stirred the pot with this one a little bit on some online forums um, because I'm from Seattle and our water is naturally, you know, what people would refer to as soft. It's just low TDS water. It's like 35 parts per million, 15 to 20 parts per million hardness and a few salts of some other, you know, slight bit of alkalinity. And guess what? Espresso is really popular here, um, <laughs> really popular in Seattle, and it has been. That's why I grew up in was the 80s coffee boom. Um, and so what you find is, and but but there's 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 a couple things to that. One, it explains why espresso machines uh, don't have many problem water quality problems in Seattle, and probably why it proliferated so early on when there wasn't something to do, you know wasn't a way to treat the water. Secondly, it also uh, you know your roast profile is a lot to do with connected to water and so in seattle in the 80s and 90s and even to the day you see a lot of roasters that roast quite a bit darker like your full city full city plus roast because um, it does do better with uh lower tds waters and if you go somewhere you got where you're cupping that coffee with higher tds waters uh you're probably you're able to roast you know have a lighter roast or maybe even an underdeveloped roast because you've got so much more bicarbonate in the water that is uh, counteracting that acidity of the roast. Thank you on that one. I've got yeah. two more questions and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm new to this TDS. I'm working to better my skills in brewing coffee. A refractometer is not a must have, but a good tool to have to better understand TDS is, is used. It, what type brand of refractometer would you recommend that would be su sufficient for a barista? Oh boy, you know, I've got really limited experience 
with those, but uh, the one that I have at work, uh, I got from HM Digital, and it you know connects with an you know connects with an app on your phone. So you got some visual tools and some recording functions in there. Um, I've used it just a little bit for drip coffee. It doesn't work. You can't really use it for espresso. It's just espresso just didn't be too dense for that refractometer to really read terribly well. But you know something like that. The other one is. Um, there's another brand that's actually more popular. Uh, I can't think of the name of it now. Man, that's bad. But there, there's a couple options out there. In addition to the the one I used in Juice was just like this little thing that you poured right. a drop onto and you looked at. Yeah. yeah. So there's definitely some some good tools out there, and they're only like a couple three hundred dollars or something like that. So okay. Two more questions, then we'll wrap it up. Um, okay. Are there any resources you recommend for learning more about water quality? Oh man, there's a bunch. So you can start with the you know SCA water quality handbook. I mean, it's it's a it's a pretty vast subject, and there's a lot of stuff that in in terms of reading about water analysis and water quality that doesn't necessarily pertain to what we do. So you will have to sort through some things if you just kind of go out there on the internet. So the water quality handbook um, is a good starting point. Um, there is the book Water for Coffee, which I think is going to come out in some sort of second pressing or something like that in maybe a slightly more accessible format because it's a little on the dense side, I'll admit. Um, uh, there are online calculator resources like Lintech, which is a water filtration company in, I think, the Netherlands or Denmark or someplace like that. Yeah. Uh, and there's some good information on there. I, I reference that all the time. Um, gosh, there's a lot of stuff out there. The other one would be the Water Quality Association, which does actually have you know, classes and training to make you a certified water technician uh, at various levels. Um, so that's another resource there. We've been a part of the uh, Water Quality Association in the past, and we've done some of the training, and I worked for a WQA certified uh, manufacturer uh, in the past. Um, and so they have a lot of resources there. When you get into that, though, again, you're going to get a lot of information that doesn't necessarily, or at least initially, seem to pertain to what we do as coffee technicians. So there's just, there's a lot out there. Um, also, if you guys go to the blog, um, part of our content group, for part of our content group, Scott created an excellent series of really basic water articles that I really recommend. I actually use it to train my techs. Um, it's the Coffee Technicians Guild blog. If you go in to search his last name, it'll come right up. I believe there's three, and we're trying to hustle more out of you, obviously, but there's three. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I got a little, uh, I got, got a little busy and got a, away from. But no, they're they're really good introduction articles on the blog. Um, last question is: We are thinking about using TDS to help our high end customers to get the most out of their coffee. Do you have any experience with measuring coffee and helping baristas to use TDS in their daily or weekly routine? Not so much in a daily routine. It's usually too there's too much going on in a cafe. I like to think of these sort of conversations as something you probably have on a more of a a quarterly basis, maybe a monthly basis. It depends upon you know where you are in the industry. If you're an independent technician, you probably won't have those conversations as often unless you're really close with the roaster. If you're working as an in-house technician, uh, I would use that as an opportunity to work as closely as possible with those people to develop that that process for yourself and use that uh, use this as a process of discovery and and figure out you know how it works for you. Thank you. Um, do you have anything you want to close with before we wrap it up? You know, just to the point that you made earlier about uh, water testing, I would recommend at the very minimum starting with a TDS meter and at every single service call, somewhere on the form that you use, the app that you use, find a space where you're going to record that total dissolved solid number, usually uh, a before and after, and just do start start there. Start there as an easy place to uh put it into your routine. You'll find it doesn't take very much time and then it becomes a habit because you'll want to look back at that information occasionally, especially when you're uh, referencing it for a customer and they want to know maybe why their machine scaled up or why their boiler failed. You can go back and look at that information and you can have a history that kind of tells a story of, well, how did we get to this point? So that's a simple thing that you can start with. And then from there, once you've made it a habit, you can add to that with the other analytes that we talked about. Thanks, my man. I appreciate it. I really appreciate you Thanks. doing this. And Scott will be doing episode six is hardness. So you'll be back for hardness. Um, yep. I want to thank all the attendees. Um, 117 people for 24 hours notice is really, 48 hours notice wow. is really good. I know, seriously. This is going to be a series of eight. And this is our pilot series. So 
no comment is unkind. We want to hear about what you guys want. We want to hear about the topics that you want to see. The goal is to do this every Friday for the foreseeable future. There will be some topics specific to text. So we are open to, to that, to seeing those questions. Um, thank you so much for attending. And we will be posting this next Friday. And next Friday's um, uh, episode is Rich Leeson. He's going to walk through basic fundamentals of nitro systems, which we get a lot of questions about and some troubleshooting. So I hope everybody attends. Scott, thank you so much. Everybody have a great weekend. Thank you. Have a great weekend.